Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. This book we have been going through now for many months. We have passed the halfway mark as we get into chapter number 9. Just going verse by verse through uh, this wonderful book, the letter that was written uh, to the church there at Corinth, a very troubled church, a church that had a lot going on that the Apostle Paul needed to straighten out. And uh, we have seen how he has dealt with all kind of things. This is, uh, this is one of those messages. I, I, I'm always... Uh, uh, sitting on G, waiting on O, uh, you know, getting ready to go preach. I mean, I'm just ready all the time. But th this is one of those messages that uh, uh, I, I wasn't exactly sitting on the edge of my seat over here ready to, to jump up here and preach. And you'll understand why in just a moment. I told Stacy this week as I've been preparing, and, and uh, I'm not kidding, man, just, just uh, dealing with it, thinking about it, studying, laboring in study. I told her what I would be preaching on, and her advice, very, very wise woman, she said, just skip over that, okay? <laughs> you don't know the temptation. Adam, I told him in deacon's meeting that uh, I almost called you to, to teach this. Because, listen, uh, this message very well could sound self-serving. It, it could sound... Um, uh, and I don't want you to take it that way. It would be self-serving if, if I just selected this text out of thin air. So if you're visiting with us tonight, I just want you to know that I, I don't do this on a regular basis, okay? We're preaching verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. And here's where we are in, uh, in chapter number 9. We're committed to the whole counsel of God at Blue Ridge View by, by thorough verse by verse teaching. And so... We've got to deal with this text, and I hope you receive it in the humility with which I have approached it, and in the humility of which I am going to share it. So, you found 1 Corinthians 9. Let's begin reading. You go ahead and stand. Let's begin reading in verse number 1, and I want to speak to you tonight on this subject. Why pay the preacher? Why pay the preacher? Verse number 1. Am I not an apostle, Paul says? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, or I only, and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working, or endure working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charge? Who plants a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it's written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or say, saith he it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he, ha that, he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. That is a very important verse right there. Amen. Verse 13, Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Father, I pray that you would take your word tonight. Thank you for this tremendous crowd on this Sunday night. And Lord, I pray very simply that you would take your word 
And God, that you would speak truth into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I think uh, if we really take time to examine it and really ponder it, I, I believe we could categorize uh, church members or many church members into one of two types. Uh, the first type of church member thinks that the pastor has the easiest job on earth. I mean, they point out it, and, and Darren and myself and other pastors, we get this all the time. By the way, if you want to get on my bad side in a hurry, say something like this. Well, preacher, you only work two days a week. <laughs> and I know what you mean when you say, I know it, it's a good running joke. But there, there are a lot of people who think the preacher has the easiest job on earth. I mean, he preaches on Sundays and Wednesdays, and the rest of the week, he can do whatever he wants to. And so, in, in between fishing and hunting and playing golf, he may have to run to the hospital and make a visit or go see a shut-in or, or show up for a surgery or he may do a wedding or he may do a funeral here or there. Sometimes he may rece even receive extra compensation for doing that. He's got an easy job. And, and then the second type of church member, uh, they understand, they think the pastor ha has a very uh, meaningful, challenging job. They, they know he doesn't just work. Two days a week, he's on call 24-7. Uh, they know that he studies, listen to this, they know that he studies many hours to prepare a message that he'll preach in just a few minutes. Uh, they understand the hard work of feeding the flock, of, of counseling, of visitation and overseeing the awesome responsibility before God for teaching and training and caring for God's people. And so... How a person or how a people view the role of the pastor determines many times how they view compensating the pastor or compensation of the pastor and all the church workers. So if you, if you see the job of a pastor is easy and light, then likely your view uh, is that the pastor shouldn't be paid too much because he doesn't do too much. On the other hand, if you view the job of the pastor as one of the, uh, one of the most difficult jobs, you believe that whatever he receives in compensation, he has earned. Now, I want to say at the very outset, and I want you to hear my heart tonight now, I want to say from the very outset that I am very, very thankful for the way that Blue Ridge View Baptist Church for 20 years has cared for and taken care of my family. Quite honestly, tonight, I want to reiterate, I'm not preaching for a raise. I'm preaching verse by verse through the Bible. Okay? And so as we approach this ninth chapter, we recall that when we finish the eighth chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul was discussing the gray areas of the Christian life uh, where we can't go to a chapter and verse to decide whether something is right or wrong. It's not specifically addressed. And so, so Paul, though, specifically addressed the problem of meat sacrificed to idols in chapter 8. And he gave us a, a very good principle. In verse number 11 of, of chapter 8, Paul talks about uh, our liberty and how if we're not careful, we will use our freedom in Christ to maybe do some things that uh, cannot be condemned in Scripture, but that it would cause a weaker brother to stumble. Paul says, man, liberty in Christ has got to be, it has got to come after our love for our brother. Amen. Our love for our weaker brother. It must always be limited by love for others. And so in chapter 9, Paul continues and he applies this principle to receiving financial support from the Corinthian church. In verses 1 through 14, the verses we just read, he outlines why he or any other church leader should receive financial support backing from the church. In verses 15 through 18, which we'll see next week, he explains why he refused that support. Now, in this text, I want to give you several reasons from Scripture, from the Apostle Paul, why pastors and, and other church workers should be supported financially by God's people. Now listen, I've told you before, I'm not doing this for my benefit, alright? If you get that, say amen. amen. I'm not doing this for my benefit. You know, one of the reasons I'm doing this is to help firmly establish this principle in the life of Blue Ridge View Baptist Church for when I am dead and gone and another pastor 
pastor follows me and, and other staff members follow. Hey, this principle ought to be deeply entrenched in the church at Blue Ridge View. All right, why pay the preacher? First of all, Paul says, because of his calling. Because of his calling. You know, sometimes churches, for whatever reason, they fail to adequately support their pastors. Some churches have the philosophy, Lord, we'll keep our pastor poor if you'll keep him humble. Amen? <laughs> and so a lot, of, a lot of churches mistreat their pastors by, by not honoring their calling from God. They, they pay the pastor... Uh, uh, much more or much less than they can afford. That they could they could do better. Man, I talk to preachers every week, very often, whose churches could do better in supporting him and his family. Sometimes uh, churches require their pastors to live in parsonages, and and that what that was maybe good years ago. But listen to me. Do you know the man of God is going to retire sometime? And if he's lived in a parsonage all his life, where's he going to go when he retires? Don't keep him from gaining equity in a home that he owns himself. Sometimes, though, pastors have contributed to their own downfall. They've contributed to, the, to a situation like this by not being faithful stewards and shepherds and by failing to teach the whole counsel of God. Right. Uh, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 17, uh, Paul said, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Especially those, listen to this, who labor in the Word and in doctrine. Those elders, especially those who give so much of their time to lead the church and to labor in the Word or doctrine, Paul says they are to be counted worthy of double honor. That literally means double pay. Now listen, a hardworking pastor may not receive double payment but his people should treat him as though he deserves it and they should seek to do best by it. Amen. And I thank you that you do. Now, Paul lists four qualifications for his ministry. You'll notice it in verse number one. Notice what he says now. In verse number one, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? First, listen to me. Those four questions, we see his four qualifications. First of all, as an apostle, he said, "Am I or Paul, am I not an apostle? An apostle, in this sense, was a special messenger of the Lord in the New Testament era. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says that the church is built upon the foundation of the, the apostles and the prophets. So primarily an apostle was one who had been taught by Jesus Christ and had been personally commissioned by him to share the gospel. Now, Paul did not sport this title arrogantly. I mean, he was not boastful about it. He absolutely he didn't use it unnecessarily. Rather, Paul was humbled by the fact that Jesus Christ would even come to him. Save him and show himself to him. In chapter 15 and verse 9, Paul said, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So, first qualification, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Second, Paul says, Am I not free? That's the second qualification of his apostleship. He was free. Christian liberty was very important to the Corinthian church. We, did, we uh, covered that in chapter 8. We learned last week that they were divided about how to use that freedom. Paul says, and Paul reminds them, that he's free too. He is free to require that they support him adequately so that he could minister effectively. Third, Paul reminds them that he had seen Jesus Christ our Lord. That was an important part in a qualification to be an apostle. Paul was not among the original twelve, but he witnessed the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus when the Lord Jesus got a hold of his heart there. Acts 22, verse 17 and 18, the Bible also talks about Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. Many, many Bible teachers, listen to this, Many Bible teachers believe that Paul was personally instructed by the resurrected Christ during the time that he was...
was in Arabia, which is mentioned in Galatians 1.17. But, but nonetheless, listen to me, his personal commission from Jesus gave him authority. And then fourth, they were his work in the Lord. That was a qualification for his apostleship. At a difficult time in his life, he had come to their city. He had evangelized them. He began the church. He taught them for many months and firmly established their ministry. Many of them were saved and discipled under the personal ministry of Paul. They were his children in the Lord. He said back in chapter 4 and verse 15, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. I've led you to faith in Christ. And so, beginning in verse number 2, Paul's qualifications really uh, entitled him to financial support. Look at verse number 2. If I be not an apostle unto others... Yet doubtless I am to you. Listen, he, he basically, if I'm not a, an apostle to others, yet doubtless I, I am to you, for you're the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. I am most definitely an apostle to you. He, he was doubtless. It was doubtless that he was an apostle to the Corinthians. You see, if any church could claim Paul as their own, it was the church at Corinth. He spent more time with them than any other church mentioned in the book of Acts. Acts 18 verse 11. The Bible says he continued there a year and six months. Teaching the word of God among them. After the incident of uh, before the proconsul in verse 18. Paul still remained a good while in Acts chapter 18 and verse 18. So he had much time. He had much effort invested in this church. And so he says that you're the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You know what a seal was? A seal refers to authenticity. In ancient times, a, a, a letter, a personal letter was sealed with wax and a signet. The Gospels tell us that the government ordered the tomb of Jesus to be sealed and posted with a Roman guard. Even in our day, some of you remember this, even in our day, there is the good housekeeping seal of approval. That tells us that a product has met certain standards. And so the Corinthian church authenticated Paul's ministry. Then Paul's defense is made by a series of tough questions in verses 3 through 6. Notice what he says in verses 3 and 4. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Now listen, they were concerned with meat sacrificed to idols. But they hadn't even helped provide meat for the man who led them spiritually. In the very least, he should expect them to provide him some food. Amen? I mean, that's a basic necessity, a basic need of life. If he's going to be a missionary, if he's going to lead a church and plant a church, man, he's got to have some food to eat so he can be strengthened to do it. Galatians 6, 6 says, Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And then notice what he asked in verse 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Now that's interesting to me. Most Bible scholars believe that Paul probably was not married. But he certainly had the right to be married uh, and take along a believing wife on his travels. Could it be, could it be that uh, they were not supporting him enough financially to afford a wife? To be able to go with him. Uh, listen, I, be I believe, now don't, don't take this wrong, don't take this wrong, but I believe that a pastor or a minister ought to be paid well enough that his wife doesn't have to work and she can join him in the ministry. Amen. Thank you, Blue Beach View, for allowing my wife to join me in ministry. And, and then with some obvious sarcasm, he asked in verse 6, he says, Or I only in Barnabas. Have not we power to forbear working? But Paul asks if benefits in ministry were only for other apostles and other pastors and teachers, but not for him and Barnabas, specifically as though only they had no right to refrain from working. And so the Corinthians should have supported Paul because of his position as their spiritual.
spiritual leader. Just as the church today should support the pastor because of his position and because of his calling. So why pay the preacher? Because of his calling. Second of all, because it's customary. It's customary. He gives three illustrations in verse 7. Notice what he says. He says, Who goeth to warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? First, no soldier goes to war at his own expense. I have never met, maybe you have, I've never been in the military, but I've never met a soldier who enlisted and who had to provide his own tank. Can you imagine if our military, (laughs) what it would be like? If we expected newly enlisted soldiers to provide their own guns, ammo, tanks, food. He says, second, no farmer plants a vineyard that not, does not eat of its fruit. In the first century, farmers would often share crop or rent land to plant vineyards and both the farmer and the landowner could share the crop. No one would plant a vineyard and not expect to enjoy the grapes that are produced. And then Paul says that no shepherd tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. He's going to receive the benefits of the work. Now, of course, there there are a lot of more modern examples of this principle. Everybody who works a job, everybody who signs a contract and works a job gets paid. The teenager who, who mows the lawn most of the time, the homeowner, pays them 25 bucks to mow the lawn. The girl who works at Walmart, she's paid by Walmart. The fireman who works for the city. The police officer who works for the city, they're paid by the city. The accountant who works for a big firm, they are paid by the firm. And the pastor who pastors a church ought to be paid by the church. It's it's customary. It's culturally customary. All right, third of all, why pay the preacher? Because it's a commandment. It's a commandment. Notice verse number 8. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. In other words, Paul's not, listen, Paul's not giving his human opinion here. Uh, rather, he's stating a biblical principle that in, envelopes both or envelops both Old and New Testaments. Even the law, Paul says, says the same also. Verse 9, look at it. In verse 9, For it's written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? You know the law of Moses? The Old Testament law you'll find back there in, in some of those laws? There were laws to take care. There were provision even for oxen. While an ox worked on the threshing floor grinding grain into powder, he was not muzzled He was allowed freely to eat of the grain that fell on the ground as his payment. And so Paul asks, is it oxen God is concerned about? And the answer, it's a rhetorical question. Obviously, the answer is absolutely not. The ox only serves to illustrate a greater principle. God is concerned about animals and provides for their welfare. Jesus told us that in John 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then Jesus asked this question, Hey boy, aren't you of more value than the birds of the air? Don't you know if I take care of them, I'm going to take care of you. Now notice what he says in verse 10. He said, or saith he, it all together for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope. And that he that thresheth in hope should be partakers or partaker of this hope. The law made that statement about oxen for our sake. If God is concerned that the oxen are paid for their own work, how much more concerned is he that men are fairly compensated for their work? The one who plows, he should hope for ample pay, reasonable pay. The one who threshes threshes, should be a partaker of his hope. All share in the harvest. Now, in verse 11, the Bible says, If we've sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Paul continues his argument. It's one of those arguments I told you last week, from the lesser to the greater. If an ox is to share in the grain it threshes, how 
much more should the farmer share in the grain? And if the farmer shares in the physical food he produces, how much more should the one who provides spiritual food be compensated? Now I want to say it again. I, I want to do this. I'm, all, I'm halfway through the message now. I, I'm very happy, content with the way Blue Ridge View compensates me. Matter of fact, I hold you up as an example to other churches. However, we need to feed on this biblical truth. We need to hold it as a core value for the future, for others who may follow in our paths. God blesses generosity. He withholds blessings many times from those who are stingy. How do you know that, preacher? 2 Corinthians 9, 6. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Amen. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Listen, I, I've made this statement for many years now. I saw it. I saw it in easily on a sign. I, I can't remember where I saw it, but I've told you this before. You don't have to be rich to be generous. You've got to be generous to be generous. Yes. It's, it's so true. God blesses generosity. Now, notice, church, we need to keep sowing bountifully. Keep on being generous with pastors and staff, missionaries who come through. We've got one of our young men who's going to Cambodia uh, this summer and, and uh, going to Israel this summer, going on mission. You know what? We need to be generous and send that young man to the mission field. Amen? The only condition is if we have sown spiritual things. Remember 1 Timothy 5, 17, Let the elders who rule well, rule well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the Word and in doctrine, those who have some spiritual things, those who labor. Those are the ones who are to be well compensated. Anybody who's lazy and who's derelict in his duties don't deserve compensation. All right, real quick, number four. Why well, pay the preacher? Because it's correct. Or you could put fair. I wrote fair in my notes too. Because it's fair. Look at verse number 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless. Now listen to what Paul says. Nevertheless, we've not used this power. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now obviously, Paul is recognizing that others had been partakers of this right to be compensated. Evidently, the Corinthian church has supported other pastors and missionaries with their offerings. It seemingly, if you study it, they took care of Peter and Apollos. But for some reason, it seems they had a little hesitation in supporting Paul. Uh, it seems there was a faction in the church that was opposed to taking care of him. And so Paul said, you know what? If anybody's got a right to receive compensation from you, I have even more reason. I have poured my life into you. I have poured my life into building this particular church. Though Paul had this right to be supported financially, he hadn't used this right. Instead of demanding support and making them feel guilty for not supporting him, Paul decided to endure all things, to suffer means to forbear or to bear or pass over silently. He did what was necessary and didn't complain. Now, you and I know, Acts chapter 18 teaches us, does anybody know? Paul had a trade. Paul had a skill. Anybody know what it was? He was a tent maker. That's exactly right. Paul often employed this trade and he did so in Corinth with Aquila and Priscilla. Now here's what he said in Acts 20. He said, You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities. I, I've made tents and sold tents, I suppose, and, and have provided for my own necessities, but also for those who were with me. The Apostle Paul worked as a tent maker not only to support himself, but also to support his fellow workers in the ministry. He said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. And so again, Paul says in verse 12, Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but suffered. We've endured things lest we hinder the gospel 
of Christ. Listen, he did not want anybody to be able to say that he was in the ministry or that he preached the gospel. He didn't want them to say that he was in it for the money. And so he said, you know what? If, if, there, if there's a faction in the church that doesn't want to pay me, then don't worry about it. I'll just refuse my right to ask for support. I don't want anybody to think that I'm in it for the money. Now he's not saying that all ministers should pay their own way. He chose this because of his own unique circumstances. On the contrary, he was teaching this church to take good care of her spiritual leaders. All right, number five. Why pay the preacher? Because it's scriptural. It's scriptural. Look at verse number 13. I'm about to be through. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. The Old Testament priest of Israel received the tithes and offerings of the crops and animals as well as the sacrifices of the people from whom they ministered to in the temple. They didn't own property, but the rest of the nation shared with the priest. This pattern was in place even before the Mosaic law and the Levitical priesthood. When Abraham defeated his enemies, the Bible says he gave tithes of the spoils to a man called Melchizedek, who was a priest of God Most High. You support through your giving because it's Scripture. And then number six, last of all, simply because it is commanded. A while ago it was a commandment, but now it is commanded. Look at verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Amen. Uh, Paul, no doubt, is referring to Jesus Christ, our Lord, referring to His commands to His disciples in Luke chapter 10. In Luke 10, Jesus said, And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. So Jesus Christ himself taught this priority, or, or gave priority to this principle that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. The clear teaching of Scripture right. is that God's people are to support those who minister to them. Amen. Blue Ridge View, I want to say, and I want to say on behalf of my family, thank you so much for taking very, very good care of us. We love you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.